Hello, good afternoon, and welcome everyone. We are happy to have you with us today for our webinar on STM32 Cube IDE for STM32L series of microcontrollers. We will give a live demonstration on how to jumpstart a new project with the STM32 Cube IDE software tool and configure it as a trusted and untrusted application using the built in features of the STM32 Cube MX. Our security expert, Kellen Magler and Franz Lefrère will explain the theoretical application flow and project architecture and show you how to configure a microcontroller and put theory into practice. And now without further delay, I hand over to Kellen. Hello and welcome to this webinar where we will introduce application development with STM32 Cube ID for STM32 L5 series of microcontrollers. My name is Tilen and I'm Technical Marketing Engineer for General Purpose STM32 or STM8 microcontrollers. Together with me is Franz, who will present application architecture and live demonstrate it later. Let's start with today's agenda. Here you can see agenda used for today's webinar. We will split the webinar into three different topics. We will start with STM32 ecosystem overview its collaterals, and what ST offers to accelerate application development for STM32. We will then continue with a brief overview about STM32 Cube ID Development Studio for application development and debugging of the final application. Last but not least, we will show application overview followed by live demonstration by my colleague, Franz. Let's start with our first chapter, STM32 Ecosystem Overview. What is STM32 Ecosystem? It is a set of all collaterals required to develop application based on STM32 series of microcontrollers. We can split them into four different groups. Hardware development tools. Those are the sets of different development boards and physical programmers to accelerate development to allow fast prototyping on STM32 microcontrollers. Second part is related to software development tools. That is software running on your host PC and features configuration tools with our STM32 Cube MX, development or debugging tool with STM32 Cube IDE, programming tool with STM32 Cube Programmer, and last but not least, monitoring tools with STM32 Cube Monitor. Let's move to the third point that is embedded software, which is set of different libraries, peripheral drivers, high-level middlewares, such as operating system, Ethernet or USB stack, and many others. And it also features expansion packages, allowing customers to add its own code bricks and prepare specific driver package for their platform or final device. We have different offers for information and sharing, starting with our st.com website, product selector for PC or mobile phone to find appropriate device versus application requirements. And we are present on all major social medias where we put our latest news and upcoming events. Various types of hardware development tools allow you to get started seamlessly with any STM32 microcontroller. STM32 Nucleo boards provide an affordable and flexible way to, for anyone to try out new ideas and build prototypes with a wide choice of specialized expansion boards. Arduino compatible and ST Morpho connectors give ability to utilize onboard microcontroller with flexible prototyping capabilities. With a discovery kit, Users can seamlessly exercise key features of any STM32 product line, while the evaluation board exposes all MCU functionality. ST is working very closely with our partners, who also provide different solutions of the hardware tools, going from simple boards up to full evaluation features and fully open hardware. All these development boards include an integrated debugger or programmer, as well as a comprehensive software library with examples that help developers to take advantage of STM32. STM32 Cube is our ecosystem offer for microcontroller development. It features software tools running on host computer and embedded software, a full set of libraries, drivers, and middlewares to support development application of the microcontroller. STM32 Cube tools offer complete development cycle Starting with initial project configuration and code generation using STM32 CubeMX, 
followed by further development and debugging with STM32CubeID. Third step in the chain are programming tools to flash the microcontroller with compiled firmware. STM32Cube Programmer has been developed for that purpose, while it also supports other command line or graphical features, such as secure Bluetooth stack update for STM32WB, and is essential tool for our secure firmware installation services. Once the final application has been flashed to the microcontroller, we can start with last but not least important step, that is long-term application monitoring. In our portfolio are now four monitoring tools, last being added end of February 2020, featuring generic application monitoring based on Node-RED web technology. It features non-intrusive monitoring and gives full freedom to customers to build their own monitoring window. It is available at st.com slash stn 32 monitor Embedded software feature two different peripheral drivers, either hardware abstraction layer or low layer drivers, that uh, including different set of middleware and custom expansion pack allowing external partners or customers to prepare software that is compatible with our stn 32 cube offer, which can later be used by stn 32 cube mx to generate their code for the final application. STN32 microcontrollers and microprocessors are based on ARM Cortex-M or ARM Cortex-A processors. Therefore, ST offers two different types of embedded software. STN32 Cube that runs on ARM Cortex-M cores offers generic drivers for microcontrollers, either hardware abstraction layer to allow building applications rapidly and to be able to migrate to different STN32 seamlessly in the future, or low-level drivers for those who want to get deep into the microcontroller peripherals and use its maximal capability at any given time. Included in the package is a big list of different middlewares, starting with operating system, TCP IP stack, USB middlewares, and many more. To make the application development easier and more flexible, we have firmware expansion packs allowing customers to import pack to the STM32 CubeMX and generate the code from it, with focus on their application, device driver, or platform configuration. There are numerous of packs available already, such as motor control suite pack, i square prom driver pack, start GFX expansion plugin for graphics, NFC reader pack, and many others. When we move to ARM Cortex-A world, we are proposing open ST Linux distribution for Linux applications. Our offer is based on Yocto and is fully upstream supporting all the hardware IPs inside the Linux. Our drivers and middlewares are from now on also hosted on GitHub, where we are publishing updates and releases very regularly. Should you need safety-ready drivers and software libraries, we can assist you by providing relevant safety self test or Class B library and all its associated documentation. Our customers value good database of information. We provide different channels where customers can find details about our microcontrollers. Starting with our website, st.com slash stn32, is an entry point for our microcontrollers and microprocessors and gives full overview and details about our offer. STMCU Finder is an application capable to run on PC or mobile that helps customers to find suitable MCU for your application and can immediately start stm 32 CubeMX for initial configuration and code generation. MCU Finder will also provide a list of all documents linked with selected MCU. It is available for STM32 or STM8 series. ST has invested a lot of resources for our community and education platform. We have community forum available at community.st.com and special STN32 education page with our trainings and open online courses, allowing customers to gain knowledge and get practical experience with STN32 by watching videos and following the instructions. Videos and trainings are also available at ST YouTube channel, youtube.com slash ST Microelectronics. We are present on all social media where you can get in touch easily with us. Some of them are Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. That was general overview about STM32 ecosystem. Let's move now to STM32 Cube ID before we continue with live demonstration of the application development. STM32 Cube ID brings customers single tool solution for complete three-in-one software development. It integrates STM32 Cube MX-like features, uh, including MCU Finder for initial MCU selection, project configuration and code generation with our stm 32 cube firmware packages. Then it allows customers to write their own application code to compile it and download the binary to the microcontroller. Last step, it features application debugging capability with step-by-step -step code execution, 
including dual core microcontrollers debug support or debugging of ARM Cortex M33 based devices, such as our latest microcontroller STM32L5 series. STM32Cube ID runs on multiple operating systems, including Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. It is based on Eclipse platform and features GCC compiler with ST enhancements. Tool is completely free of charge for personal and commercial usage and is available at st.com. If we take a look at the screenshot of the tool, on the left side is project tree with files that are going to be compiled and linked together. Middle part is project open with built-in stn 32 cubemx allowing customers to change configuration and generate the code with single button click while watching actual C code changes in the third window where application is written afterwards. We have developed project importer from Atolic True Studio or software workbench for STM32. This means that all previous projects developed in any of those two software tools can be now seamlessly migrated to STM32 Cube ID and its development can be continued inside our tool. Furthermore, if you already have an IOC file for STM32 Cube MX project, you can now import it into STM32 Cube ID and continue development in the signal tool as shown on the right picture on the slide. Debugging is one of the most important steps during application development. Here are listed some of many features supported by stm 32 cube ID on top of its classical debugging interface such as code stepping, variable view, memory view, and others. We are supporting currently ST-Link hardware debugger available on every stm 32 development board, as well as Sager J-Link should you use it. Configuration is extensive and supports multiple choices in order to fit to your hardware setup. Live expressions have been added to support variable view while code is executed in real time without performance penalties. Should you need to display some data, we do offer serial wire viewer where data can be graphically displayed in separate window. There is an integrated UR terminal which allows you to use ST-Link virtual COM port capability that is available on our Nucleo or Discovery boards. With our value line flashless products, we propose code execution from external quad or OCT SPI memory, and therefore application needs to use external loader. We are providing external loaders for all our discovery or evaluation boards, or we give you an ability to add your own loader to flash external memory, directly integrated inside stm 32 cube ID. stm 32 cube ID supports multi-project debugging at the same time, that is used with our dual-core stm 32 h 7 or trust zone enabled microcontrollers such as stn 32 l 5 We will now demonstrate application development and debugging using stn 32 cube ID. Franz will present all steps to successfully prepare trust zone enabled application on stn 32 l 5 with stn 32 cube ID development studio using its integrated features from stn 32 cubemx So welcome to this live demo. First, a short agenda. I would like to give you a sh short introduction about Cortex M33 Trust Zone. Then I will describe the Trust Zone application we will create together, and then we will create it and debugging it thanks STM32 Cube ID. First, what is Trust Zone? In fact, it's a new extra processor state with hardware isolation. You probably know the ARM v7 architecture with the thread mode and the handler mode. And switching to the ARM v8, you can see that we've got this additional state, secure or non-secure. We still have thread mode and handler mode, but we have a strong isolation between the secure world and the non-secure world. If I take the example of STM32L4, we've got a Cortex M4, so we've got one C-stick, vector table, memory protection unit, and stack pointers. We've got IP inside our device, like user, timer, ATC, etc., etc. We've got the flash, where is located our program, and the RAM. Switching to the STM32L5 trust zone, now look at the core. We've got two six stick, one secure, one non-secure. The same for the vector table, for the MPU, and for the stack pointer. So that means it's as if we've got two states of the core, one secure, one non-secure. Regarding the resource, it will be the same, because the STM32L5 with trust zone have an additional security and isolation at hardware level for peripheral and memories. That means the flash will be split in secure part of the flash and non-secure part. The same for the RAM. Each IP could be assigned to the secure world or to the non-secure world. 
how we are doing the switching, the switch, sorry, between secure and non-secure. When you boot, you're always in secure mode. So the secure code is executed. This one will configure the split between the secure and the non-secure world. And then the secure can always call or have access to the non-secure code. We've got a specific assembly instruction, which is big NS. Uh, this one will imply the switch of context between secure to non-secure. But what is not possible is to directly call some secure code from the non-secure code. Here we will have an exception. So we've got an additional state, but it's not a state, I would say interfaces. That means the non-secure code could call the non-secure callable API. And here we've got a specific instruction, secure gate, which will switch from non-secure mode to secure mode. And then this non-secure callable API will call the secure code. That means the isolation is done by defining very precisely the API of what the non-secure code can call as services in the secure code. And then we can come back from secure code to the non-secure code, thanks to the XNS instruction. So it's quick. I go very fast on TrustZone because it's not the purpose of this, but what TrustZone imply? In fact, you will need two applications. One secure application, which will be located in the secure flash, which will be executed at boot, which configure the platform security. That means the split between the secure world and the non-secure world. Then it will call the non-secure application, and it will implement some non-secure callable API. That way, the non-secure part could call some services in the secure world. Not secure application, it will be launched by the secure application and should be located in the non-secure flash and potentially it could call the non-service callable API. So as you can see, many constraints, not very easy to start. We will say that with STM32 CubeID, it will help you to start with a huge framework or old framework for this. So let's create an application together. First, I will, let's define it. What I propose is to use the STM32 L5 for sure, and we've got secure world, non-secure world. Two resources, a LED and a button. What I want to do is to put the LED in the secure world and the button in the non-secure world. And let's implement such kind of things. So first we boot in secure. We will configure the split between the secure world and the non-secure world. That means we will assign the secure LED or the GPIO that, that drive the LED in the secure world. And we will assign the GPIO that's uh, under the public button in the non-secure world. Then we just jump to the non-secure. So we change the context. And in the non-secure world, we will just monitor the button. Is the button press? Yes. Then we will call a services, which is toggle pin. And this toggle LED will be take place in the secure context. Then we will come back to the non-secure. So quite simple application, and you will see that we will do it quite fast. Which information we need? I would say which hardware resources we will need. It's an information of what is the GPIO for the LED and the public button. So we will use a Nucleo STM32 L552. If we are using the, or looking at the user manual, we can find that the LED is connected to the PB7 and the button is connected to PZ13. So we've got all the information. Um, now we will do the configuration of the board. So now I will need to configure my board, um, or I will say my chip, because by default on the STM32 L5, the trust zone is not enabled. So I will launch Cube Programmer. Let's connect to it. Go in the option by section, and I'll have, have a look in the user configuration. Here we've got the option by trust zone enabled. If it's unchecked, you don't have trust zone activated on your chip, and we want to use it. So I just apply it, down. Second thing I have to configure, the flash is divided in two banks, and by default, the both are declared as secure. You can see the address here for the first region, and for the second one, here is the definition of the second bank. I want to remove the security of this second bank and use it where I, where I will store my non-secure application. So I will just modify it that way, 
I mean I put a higher address in the start regarding the N. This will remove security on this portion of memory. Perfect, so my board now is ready to work in the stress zone. I disconnect, close it, and now let's launch QBID. So often if you just launch for the first time, you should have this interface. So let's start a new STM32 project. You can also do it through this way. The target selector. So I can use board selectors or MPU selector. Uh, in our case, I prefer to go in the MPU selector because I want to configure everything by my own. Here we've got the one associated to the Nucleo. For your information, in the Dock and Resources, you've got data sheet, reference manual, data sheet, and many information about this chip. Let's define just the application. So it was the name of my project. I will use the C code. Treason is enabled on my target for sure. And we will use a project type of stm 32 cube because we want to define it thanks our interfaces. Here we've got the firmware package used, the location of the repository, and the way you want to generate code. I want to switch to the STM32 CubeMX perspective. Okay, so those who are familiar with STM32 CubeMX know these interfaces. For the others, it's quite simple. We've got the pinout and configuration. Here you can activate all the IP and define the pinouts. Then we've got the clock configuration. I will give you more about this after. So first, you can see that for the connectivity, just this example, for a result, I can select to be in secure or non-secure. I can assign, I will say, this IP to the secure world or to the non-secure world. By default, this is not seen because I can just remove the context and you don't see it there, but just only in the mode and configuration, but useful just to see it just here also. So I can assign it to secure and then basically I can just configure my route that way. Okay, just to show you how you can assign uh, um, an IP to one world or to the another world. Quite simple. I just want to give a special word about this one, GTSC, which is a global trust zone controller. I don't want to go too much into detail, but we'll say this IP is responsible for gathering all illegal access trust zone and generate IT associated to them. It will also uh, handle the RAM assignation between secure world and the non-secure world, and also external memory, okay? So, very important one. You will see that in our secure code, it will be automatically a code. By default, the configuration is okay for us, so let's keep it that way. Clock configuration. So here you've got the whole clock three, and for the moment, we are at 4 MHz, but we can decide to go up to 110 and just request the system to compute what are the parameters to achieve this speed. And you can see now we are on parallel. It computed automatically this. Quite useful. You can assign this configuration to the secure world also. That means it will be done in the secure world and only the secure world could modify it. For the project manager, heap and stack, as, you, as you usually I would say. And that's it. So now let's configure our LED and our button. So for the LED, you remember it was PB7. If I zoom in, so it will be a GPIO output. Then if I do a right click, 
I can enter a user label, more convenient for programmation. And then here you get the menu pin, re sorry, pin reservation. Here you can select to be secure or non-secure. Here, quite easily, the LED will be part of the take your word. For the button, PC13. This time it will be a GPIO input, sorry. <laughs> GPIO input. Then enter user label, button. And we will put it in a non secure world. And in fact, we finish. We just assign the GPIO in the secure and non secure world. The code is ready. So just save. It will generate the code for us. Let's have a look about the code generated. So we've got our Trezon project, and inside, in fact, we've got now two applications. Okay, so all the complexity to create the both applications and link them together is handled by the STM32 cube ID. We've got the application secure and the application non-secure. You've got the associated linker file for each one. You've got the source code for both of them. Quite similar, I would say. But you can see that there is an additional one in the secure part whose name is secure underscore nsc.c. Remember nsc? Non-secure callable. In fact, it was the link between the non-secure world and the secure world. The non-secure world will call some non-secure callable API of the secure world. So the definition of those API will be done in this header file and the implementation will be done in this file. Now I propose to have a look in the main.c of each application. So the first executed is the secure one. What do we have here? So in the main, I shell in it. GTZC, you remember the global trust zone controller. So here it's a kind of a portion of the security is also configured here. And we've got our GPIO in it. Let's have a look. Here for the LED, we just configure the pin, I will say as usual. But you can see that for the button, we configure it as non-secure. In fact, by default, all the GPIO are secure. I would say part of the secure world. So here we just need to declare the button GPIO as part of the non-secure. And we finish. I would say for the configuration or the split of the secure world. This has been already done by the system. Next step will be to call the non-secure init function and this one it's just a jump to the non-secure world. And the context will be done, the change of the context will be handled automatically by the core. So if we jump to the main.c of the non-secure world, we've got just a shell in it, system clock config, because we keep the configuration in the non-secure world. The GPIO in it, here we just have the button configuration. Okay, so we can see we've got both application with everything is already ready for our implementation. So let's start. First, let's define the non-secure callable API. Okay, something simple. Toggle pin. Good. And let's implement this API in the secure underscore nsc.c. So Let's do a copy pass to avoid error. What is important here is to add this attribute. These have been already defined in our environment. This one allows the compiler to add this secure gate instruction or the switching of the context. Okay, so it will be the compiler which will take everything um, in charge. It will define the switching of the context, push the register that need to be pushed and such kind of things. Just adding this one, okay? So now we've got the implementation of our API. Control space for completion. Here I just want to toggle the LED. 
GPIO port. And the lead pen. In fact, that's it. I would say now we've got the definition of our API here. Here we've got implementation of our API with this specific attribute. You can see you already have some one API, which is a secure register callback. This allows the non-secure world to register some function that could be called from the secure world. For example, when the GTZC find an interrupt, it can call a non-secure um, function if you register it and then just say, okay, there is a problem, there is a violation, please display a message warning we are being attacked or something like that. This is just an example. But for us, we finish for our LED, LED toggling. Now let's go in the non-secure application. So what we need to do is just to monitor the level of the GPIO. So let's test it. So we just read the pin. The return GPIO port. Return pin. And if this one is set, that means someone push the button. So then I will call my non-secure callable happy eye, which is just this one. Oops, sorry. That could be best. Okay, maybe just add a show delay. Just to ensure we don't have too much toggling. And that's it. So now we need to compile. In fact, the booths are linked together because you will call here the API here. So we need when we compile non-secure code also to compile the secure code. This is already under by the system in the properties. You can see in the project preference, there is a dependency with the app secure. So when you compile the non-secure one, it will compile also the secure one. If I just launch the application build, here first, it compiles the, the secure one. And then the non-secure one. Compilation is OK. Next step, we want to flash and debug. So here, let's create a debug configuration based on the non-secure. If we will have a look in the startup, it will just download and debug the non-secure application. But in fact, I want to debug the both. So let's add also the secure application. Just say I want the release one. I won't perform the build because it's already down by the non-secure application which builds the secure one, but I want to download it, unload the symbol associated. Perfect. Oh, sorry, I take the release one. Not good. I want the debug one. Yes, but I don't want to pay for it. Okay, so everything seems ready. A last point. We set a breakpoint in main, but in fact we've got two main, one in the non-secure, one in the secure. And with this configuration, we will put a breakpoint in the main of the non-secure, which is what I don't want to do. I would like to start on the main of the secure or stop on the main of the secure. So I will just move up this one and now I will show to stop in the main of the secure. Okay, let's close the debug. We are switching to the debugging perspective. And now we are stopping the main. Which one? In fact, look at this. We've got the GTZC in it, so that means we are in the main.c secure. Okay. Here you've got the state of the processor. We are in secure mode. Okay. If I just run it, break it, I'm stop software in the main I shall delay. But if I click here, we've got in the non-secure context. Okay. So here, it's a way to know what is the CPU state. Run it again, and let's check if it's working first. 
if I push the button, the light is toggling. Okay? So from a functional point of view, we've got everything. So what I propose now is to see the switching context. Let's put a breakpoint just in toggle pin. Now I push the button and I stop in the toggle pin. What I would like to go now, it's more in the assembly code. So I will ask to instruction stepping mode. And now let's have a look in the assembly code. If I step in, step over, step over, I would like to show you when we've got the secure gate instruction. So look at the CPU state. We are in a non-secure world. Here we've got this specific instruction and we are in the range of secure address. If I just do a step over, we switch to secure world. Okay? So this is really this instruction which does the, the switching between non-secure world to the secure world. Um, if I step over, I would like to see how we switch back to non-secure world. In fact, it will be there. I will just put a breakpoint. Go. We are still in the secure. It was a BXNX, BXNS, branching non-secure. If I just do a step over, we come back to the non-secure world. Okay, so it's just to give you the, the detail about it. Okay, so that's it. We managed to build quickly this application. We are switching from secure world to the non-secure world and to the resources. Maybe I want to show you a last things. If I have a look in the register, you will see that there is some duplication of register definition. For example, for our uh, button, PC13, we've got the GPIOC and we also have the SEC GPIOC. In fact, it was the same IP, but it was the way you assign it to the secure world or to the non-secure world. Here, the GPIO C, or the, the, the C13, is assigned to the secure world. And in fact, in the non-secure world, you can address secure world address. But here, we can only see, I would say, the input register of the button. If I just continue and push the button, you can see the value that are being modified. But we can see it in the non-secure address of the GPIO. And we are in a non-secure world. Okay? And symmetrically, for the PB7, it should be in the SEC GPIO, but when we are in the context of the security. Okay? So if I just step in always in this way, let's step in. So I come back to this one. Let's go to the secure gate. Okay. Here, the register. G oh, sorry, not this one. This one. So PB13 secure is disabling. If I just do, so we are in non-secure world. I go in the secure, and now I can see the GPIO secure. Okay, the configuration of the value. Okay, this is really what I want to show you right now. We managed to define our application quickly, implement it quite easily, I would say, and we can debug it also. So thanks for your attention. I hope you like this uh, demo.